Hi, this is Tom Malloy. I wanted to talk to you and the, the people, the members of Stage 32 about my latest film, Ask Me to Dance, and kind of how I took that from inception idea all the way to the theatrical release that comes out in the beginning of October and how it could help benefit the people on Stage 32. I'm a huge fan of the site. RB and Amanda are friends of mine, close friends. Um, I've always told people, if you're looking for connections and a network, well, there it is. You know, it's like people want to be networking all the time in this space and in the movie business. It's like, well, why not go to stage 32 and build your network immediately from there? You know, just recently somebody asked me if I had any craft services connections in Los Angeles. And it's like, well, yeah, I can go to films that I've produced in the past and find who is the craft services people, look them up, and it's like, or you could just go to Stage 32 and just find somebody that does that on there. So it's it's fantastic community. And, uh, well, a little bit about myself. My name is Tom Malloy. I've been doing films for 20-plus years now. Uh, started as an actor, and I've starred in, in a bunch of films, been, been in maybe 30, 40 movies. Uh, screenwriter, I've written 30 plus screenplays, I've options sold or made the movies, 25 of those screenplays. I just completed my 20th film producing, and that's hands-on producing, that's not just attaching a credit <laughs> to a, a film. I've raised almost 30 million dollars now of private equity for films. I also co-own Glasshouse Distribution, the uh, film sales and distribution company, and I wrote the book Bankroll, which was kind of the gold standard book of film financing back in the day, and now is um, is is out of print. It was the first edition was 2008, second edition 2012, and then moved all that to an online instructional called Filmmaking Stuff. But let me talk a little bit about this latest film, Ask Me to Dance, which, funny enough, was my directorial debut. Let me start by saying. It, it was a dance film, romantic comedy, and it was a very special thing for me because I used to teach ballroom dancing. I was a fan of ballroom dancing, and when I first started ballroom dancing, it was in 1998, I believe, or 97, around that time. And I saw a dance called West Coast Swing, and I fell in love with that dance immediately because West Coast Swing is not like the old East Coast Lindy Hop Swing. It's um, more smooth and slinky, and it's dance to contemporary music. That was the big thing for me. It wasn't dance to... Uh, music that I didn't listen to. It's not that I was against salsa merengue. It's just I don't drive along in my car listening to that music. And West Coast Swingers dance to hip hop, R and B, blues, pop, um, all the music that you would that I was listening to, the contemporary music. And I said I want to do that dance. And what happened was in in 2007, I uh, wrote and produced a dance film called Love and Dancing, and it was myself and Amy Smart and Billy Zane and Betty White. I got to dance with Betty White in that movie. It was amazing. I had the director of She's All That, Robert Ifscove, he did that. And uh, what what it was was, I mean, the timing and and and, uh, and things about the film and, and stuff I couldn't control. I was younger. Um, ultimately, I would say maybe 25% of my vision made it to the screen. And that's nothing against the director. He was great. It's just that usually the director's vision is was gonna make it to the screen. And then we released opposite Star Trek the first of the Chris Pine Star Treks and just got destroyed in the movie theater. Putting that behind me and moving on to other films, uh, I remember thinking, okay, let me give another dance film another try, right? And I wanted to do something different this time because I, I may, used to make the joke that all dance films are one of two things. They are either uh, a rich guy, rich gal, opposite of that, poor guy, poor gal, any of those permutations in between, uh, it learns how to dance, it changes their life. And that's 90% of all dance movies right there, uh, if you think about it. And the other 10% is like a place is closing and they're gonna put on a dance show to save that place, right? So that's every dance movie. And Love and Dancing fell into the category of the first one, the 90%. Uh, someone learns how to dance, it changes their lives. And so I wanted to make something completely different. And what I did is I went back to comedy, and this is an interesting point for the people on here, is that I never really branded myself as an actor, producer, or writer. I'd done all kinds, horror movies, dramas, thrillers, all kinds, and actually didn't even do comedy. I Love and Dancing was very kind of a light comedy. And uh, I decided as a director that I wanted to brand myself. I wanted to direct a movie, and I wanted to brand myself as a comedy director. Now you see, the, the, the lesson here is that if you brand yourself as something, as a horror actress, or a, um, a horror writer, or something like that, 
uh, that you can, then people start to put you in a box and you may think, oh, I don't want to be put in a box. It's like, yes, you do. You actually want people to go, um, oh, I got a new horror movie. Like, who can we get to star in that? Oh, she does all these horror movies. She's the horror movie person. Or who can I get to write that, uh, that thriller? Oh, he does these great crime thrillers, right? Versus if you have everything kind of a shotgun everywhere, no one will say, oh, that, that person, you know, let's get him to write this comedy or her to do this drama or something like that, right? And, so I, as a, as a director, I said, I want to only do comedy. So after this one, I got another comedy lined up so that, you know, if this, this all leads through a successful path, then down the road, they go, Oh, there's this new, you know, Will Ferrell comedy. Like, Oh, we got to get Tom Malloy to direct it. You see what I'm saying? So that's where the branding comes in. So I wanted to do a dating comedy and take all the horror stories from dating and uh, other people's horror stories and, and friends and put them all in and just have a world where great dancing existed and no one pointed to it and said, that's West Coast Swing or there's going to be a competition. It was just there. And these two couples connect dancing and dancing is, is fantastic because it transcends all race and, uh, and hatred and, and it, it, it truly is love and it's two people connecting on the dance floor. So it, it, it was truly a dating comedy and that was the inception of it was to do something different like that. So put together Ask Me to Dance. Now, what happened was uh, I it was introduced to a high net worth individual than H and I, you'll hear me refer to that a lot, uh, and a high net worth individual through another friend, right? Um, a friend of mine that was an actor, and I get intros all the time and you never know where they're gonna go. And I met uh, an H and I named Charlie who was a, a very successful in the cryptocurrency space. And what's very interesting about this is that when I finally set up the, the Zoom with this person uh, through my buddy Jason, uh, I was pitching a different movie. And this is a, definitely another great lesson is that I was pitching a different film and felt the vibe, he, he's not gonna do this, he's not interested. And I swear, I was this close to just being like, well, maybe something in the future. Like, almost, almost hung up, because I, I have a lot of things coming in and going around, and uh, so I was just gonna say, there's another person put in the category of maybe someday in the future, who knows. And I just had a little whisper in my head, you should try pitching him on the dance film. And I said, you know, I, I have this dance movie, and he immediately said, well, my wife's a dancer. She used to be a dancer and she's an actress. And it was great. And she ended up, the long story short is she ended up playing a supporting character in the movie and she was fantastic. But let me back up and say, that is one of the approaches that I use to raise financing for films is the vested interest approach is what I call it. Meaning somebody has an interest in the film that's not just financially based, right? Anybody, you, you can pull in investors all the time financially based, but a vested interest approach is to pull people in that it may want a role for their wife in this case, or they have a location that they'd like you to use, or they need publicity for this or that. Whatever it is, that's a vested interest approach. In fact, that is the number one way to raise funds for documentaries is vested interest approach, because you can't really raise the funds of documentaries based on a financial model when a lot of them don't make money. But if it's say it's about dolphins and this person, their vested interest is they, they dolphins are all that they're passionate about in the world, then you're pitching your dolphin documentary to them, right? And that's the vested interest approach. So we started putting this film together, started putting the cast together. Now, funny enough, uh, in another story that I'll share with stage 32, because I know there's probably a lot of actors on here, is that I didn't even expect to be have a role in the film. I expect to just direct it and see where it goes, but it was one of these things where our budget kind of went out the, the window uh, on the first couple actresses that, uh, actor and actress that we got in. Um, and, uh, it, you know, we had Brianna Evigan, who was the star of uh, the Step Up movies with Channing Tatum, and she was great. And so we our just budget was tighter and tighter. And it was like, now I'm a comedian for, gosh, since I've performed in front of crowds since I was 11 years old, starred in a bunch of movies, but was still thinking with that producer's mindset of we wanted to get a name. And the people who were getting the names, they'd like either, they were very funny. Funny guy's easy to find, right? You can find a good comedian, uh, a comedian male that can dance. All right, you've now narrowed the field a little bit, okay? So a comedian, a comedian that could dance, and then a comedian that would do it for you know, the teeny money that we have left and, and they're famous, right? Like we had to get all four. It was impossible, right? To get all those four things lined up, um, except for me. Now the fame is, is, you know, whatever fan base I got is over here, but, uh, danced for years, used to teach dancing, uh, comedian for years and uh, done comedy since I was 11 years old. And, um, 
you know, I would do it for whatever and, and not worry about the uh, amount of pay. So it had its own challenges uh, somewhat, uh, especially when you're you're on camera and you're directing. And in that case, I had David Josh Lawrence, who's a friend of mine, uh, my one of my closest friends, and he's a great comedian and actor. And I had him watching the monitors. And we, I had the first person I would walk to right as soon as it was done and say, let's talk. And what did you see? And, and things like that. As, in addition to watching the playback on, on times if I was uncertain about a scene. But so, uh, the, the shoot itself presented some problems because of the COVID. The uh, uh, pandemic was still going on. They had the COVID restrictions on set. And now, like I said, I've produced three films since then, and there's still COVID restrictions through uh, the Screen Actors Guild, uh, the SAG-AFTRA. And um, look, all I can say to that is that you have to get that fine line between being stupid and being like, let's just ignore them all because no one's going to catch us. And that's crazy. And then somebody catches COVID and then you've got to shut down your movie and that's horrible. And, and the other part of it is, completely over policing yourself and you know that's something that you have to remember too is that all of that budget that you put into the covid is is not going to appear on screen that's that's not going to appear on screen all it is is kind of insurance to keep your set safe so be safe but don't over police that would be my my thing there and of course we did it fantastic and, and followed all the regulations we needed to and we had zero people get sick and we had mass, massive crowds of extras uh you know that everybody was there and tested and, and or vaccinated or both and um is successful in that regard. So, well, what else can I tell you? Well, one thing is that we, uh, we've we had some people ask, oh, where's there gonna be a festival run? Now, you do, first off, I, I co-own uh, Glasshouse Distributions, a sales and distribution company, so I'm in that kind of world of, of selling films and, and getting them out to the market, but what I would like to say is that most of the time when you have a commercial type film, which this is, it's a funny comedy, um, you don't, necessarily need the festivals, right? And I would say it's usually the festivals are better for something like a horror film or a drama or something where you want to garner some awards and make it like distinct. Um, once I fell into the trap of trying to think that we were going to win all these awards at festivals, and we did, we won a certain amount of awards with a movie I did called Hashtag Screamers, but we lost almost two years uh, chasing festivals and ones we got in and didn't get in in over two years. And then by the time the film was released, in 2019, the date on the film, I believe, was 2017. And that, I might have missed that. It might be 2016 and 2018. I'll have to think about exactly when it was released. As we all know, time has become a little blurry since COVID. But meaning, it doesn't matter. What it was was a plus two on the IMDb year of the film when it had never been released, never been seen in public. And that's a problem. That's something that you, you want to avoid. So not saying you got to avoid the, the festival runs. I'm saying just watch dating your film because that's exactly what it does. Back to Ask Me to Dance, um, we were able, we had a great sales agent that I had attached early on. XYZ Films, one of the top companies there is. And you say, well, Tom, I thought you said you owned a sales company, and I do. But when it's a film that I'm that close to where I produced it, directed it, whatever, I'm in it, something like that, we don't do it through our company. I've always said, kind of said that as a rule because it's kind of a conflict of interest for the filmmakers that we're representing uh, so they don't think we're pushing my movie more or anything like that. So XYZ Films did the sales and uh, they were signed on. They were friends of mine that I'd made connections with for years and so I highly encourage you to do that. You'd be making these connections at the American film market in Santa Monica in November, the European film market in Berlin in February, or the Cannes Marché de Film, which is in May. And those are where you're going to make the connections for these sales agents, get a relationship going. And if you could sign somebody on early on, they can help advise with cast. Uh, they can help uh, kind of set it up for success in the marketplace. And XYZ Films, when we were done, we delivered the film. They helped us with a trailer, and we love the trailer that they helped put together. And they took it to market. Now, unfortunately, the market was still in the COVID stages and it, we, we wanted to get the, the buyers into a theater, but it was we were kind of advised against it at that time because still buyers were you know kind of wonky about going to theaters. But uh, we were able to get Electric Entertainment to come in and we had a couple different offers on the film, but Electric Entertainment we loved because they loved the film. And that's something, another lesson I would give to you all is to make sure that you um, kind of qualify somebody making a deal, jump on a Zoom, right? And, and or, or do a face-to-face -face if possible and, and hear what they think about your film. And if they're like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll see what we can do. That's one thing. But if they're like, we love this. Like I watched this film with my wife and kids that which we, Electric did, you know, it was like, that's what the, the, the buyer had said to us. That was exciting and that, that makes us happy. Now, another thing that I will suggest to anybody is when you get any offer, no matter how good that Zoom went, 
go to um, IMDb and find films that they've done before and then reach out to the producers and ask them, what was your experience like working with this company, okay? Uh, the practice of asking for references is the absolute dumbest practice in the world. I remember reading this in a management book years ago, and it made so much sense. And I go, yeah, that's right. That's, it makes no sense because it, it, it was like a light bulb going off. Anybody's going to give you references of people that love them, right? If I say, oh, give me three references, they're going to pick three people that love you. Any company's going to do that. So it's a, it's a crazy practice. It shouldn't be done. But if you just go and you pick the movies, three, four of those movies uh, on IMDb, IMDb Pro, and reach out to the producers. Trust me, I have many producer friends and myself, happy to tell you if I had a good experience, happy to tell you if I had a bad experience. And they'll, and get some feedback that way. So it's not pre programmed or set up, right? Get some feedback that way. And our feedback was positive. And so now, planning to do the theatrical release uh, is October 7th. At, uh, you can check out the, the local listings or check out askmetodancemovie.com. And you'll see all the theaters nationwide that it's releasing in uh, in 30 cities nationwide. But that in itself is also challenging and new, right? There's certain things that I learned theatrically that weren't a thing years ago. You know, the whole thing of prints, where you actually literally had to print canisters and, uh, you know, make these prints of film and actually bring them to the theater or ship them to the theater was always a cost, right? And then it moved to what's called the DCP, Digital Cinema Package, I believe. and uh, But DCP is basically the digital file of your movie. And they used to come on these crew drives, and those you would have to ship. So it was like shipping just a print, but a smaller version of the print. Um, and now it's all done digitally. Now it's all done with an Aspera upload of the DCP, and the DCP is downloaded and, and sent to the theater, and it's done digitally. Another thing that I found that was new is there's almost never printed posters anymore. They even do that digitally. They have TV screens that are, you know, turned vertically, and that's where they put the posters for the movie. So it's just so much easier, and that process is, is easier in a way. And theaters, I believe, need a certain amount of films, especially commercial films. But ultimately, it comes down to this. Now, whether or not the film is a success, October 7th, when it releases, and we're hoping uh, that everybody that tries to go goes the opening weekend so that we can get that per screen average up, and then it'll play longer, uh, and then we release on VOD November 8th, or whether or not we're successful, the theatrical run will help the VOD in the future. But if you say, uh, oh yeah, then let's definitely do a theatrical run for the movie that you're doing, you have to qualify that. Are you going to be able to put butts in seats? Which is really, at the end of the day, all that matters. Butts in seats is what everybody cares about. Um, because you say, all right, uh, Tom, you own 600 movie theaters. Like, can you put my movie in 600 theaters? Okay, you put it in 600 theaters. Who's going to know? Who's going to know that it's there? Right? And if I'm a theater owner, and I have the choice between playing the next Avengers movie and uh, your film which there's no marketing behind. Of course I'm gonna play that, because that one's got spent $100 million on marketing and there's commercials running and all that stuff and that's gonna bring butts into the seats. And you know, what I'm getting at is that you have to find a way to get people there. And in a pitch to any theater, they're gonna be happy when you say, uh, you know, we have an audience, we have a fan base in this city. We shot the movie in Houston, let's just say, and all of the cast and crew are gonna come on the opening night. Okay, that's a pitch. Right, that's a pitch to a theater because say they have Avengers playing in seven of the screens that have their ten screens, they'll just say, "Well, let's just put it on an eighth screen. We'll pick up some money that way." Versus playing your movie in there, if you can bring a crowd, so butts and seats are all that matter. And um, if you're trying to do it where it's not just a promotion for the VOD, you're actually trying to make money off the theatrical. I'd say you know it all depends on the butts you can put in seats. I hope these lessons helped you as far as you know, getting your film out there and having an idea. It's almost like a case study of the beginning of the inception of the movie all the way to sales and uh, always open for questions. You can always reach me at Tom at filmmakingstuff.com. Happy to answer questions about everything and uh, good luck with your film and I hope to see your film in theater soon.